thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here and glad to join you all this afternoon. I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful lunch and um, you're still alive and alert and awake. And we're going to do a little bit of movement um, now and, and in just a little bit. So hopefully we'll, I'll be able to keep you awake to some extent. Um, appreciate that introduction, but just wanted to give you just a little bit more background about um, how I came to be involved with disability and have a lot of uh, interest in, in healthful mobility um, beyond my dance-related background, which is very heavily in performance and choreography. Um, uh, after I graduated with my um, graduate degree, I began working with a mixed ability dance company, uh, individuals with MS, cerebral palsy, um, different kinds of, um, sometimes other kinds of limitations, or what we perceive as limitations, and it was always my interest to, just in the dance population that I worked with, to make sure that dancers were dancing healthfully. So we have a lot of injured dancers, we have a lot of dancers who don't take care of their bodies properly and then burn out at early ages. So I was always concerned with, um, and interested in dance medicine and dance science, and that was really a big interest of mine. I started doing a second degree in, in the sciences, and um, I'm still kind of following, following that path. So I wanted to just um, give you a little bit of, of research um, background on what I've discovered is out there and happening in terms of dance and dance benefits, particularly for Parkinson's. I've only done a little bit of work with a Parkinson's support group. Um, I'd be open to doing more, and certainly it is uh, definitely an area of interest for me. But I thought I could at least bring to you um, my movement expertise and try to um, give you maybe some ideas, something you can do, some things you might be able to do on your own, and just share with you again the research that's kind of out there. So the National Parkinson's Foundation recommends put on some upbeat music and dance. Um, that's a um, wonderful suggestion. And um, just in terms of research, some, one study has shown that habitual participation in social dancing over, year, over several years is associated with superior balance, postural stability, gait function, and late reaction time compared to age-matched non-dancers. So this in particular was a study that involved social dancing, and in particular um, was, I believe, walk, waltz, foxtrot, and tango. So traditional exercise programs, we, we kind of know the benefits of exercise, and, and we should all be staying mobile as, as, we, as we can. But in terms of dance, um, dance tends to incorporate constant physical challenges while being enjoyable and engaging. Um, so just just a little bit of a difference there. And when you, and, and really and really dance is all about communication. It's all about um, it, it isn't isn't just about the functionality of movement, going and getting a cup and drinking and things like that, going and just doing daily tasks, but it's much more about communication. And we communicate through movements. We're physical beings that um, the only way that we relate to the environment and to each other is through our, our movement and our, our movement initiations. We hug, we hold hands, um, our greetings to each other, our um, you know, hellos, goodbyes are all emotional communication through the language of our body. So really that's all that, what dance is about. So, so it's very much tied into a, per a personality and it's tied into emo emotional expression, much more beyond just this idea of let's just make sure that the, the legs are mobile or the arms are mobile. It really goes beyond that and that's how I see um, dance as being very um, key and important um, in terms of its, its movement benefits. So a couple things I'd like to try with you just for fun. Um, one of the things that dance does is sort of engage that sense of play and playfulness and creativity, which we sometimes forget as adults that we still are creative people. Um, sort of start to lose some of that and the structure and, and the restriction of society. What I'd like you to do is um, if you could turn to a partner and um, actually, not yet. Um, think, let's do that in a minute. Um, thinking about a um, your daily your your daily kind of movement habits. Um, I know you may not think that you dance um, and that you dance every day, but in fact you do dance every day. It's my contention that, that people are dancing all the time and they don't realize it. Um, and just because I have a very very sort of broad view of dance, and then you know what what makes pedestrian movement dance is just the fact that we turn it into rhythm, and then we add some spatial ranges, and we we, tra we we add transitions and things like that that make it sort of feel more dance-like. So let me take some, some daily um, movement that you do. Uh, probably one of the first things you did this morning was turn off the alarm. 
So as our first movement, we're, we're going to take this idea of, of turning off an alarm. And so we're just, we're just going to take this movement here, very simple, just that movement. That's our first movement, is turning off an alarm. And our second movement, um, you probably got out of bed at, at some point and, and managed to, to take some steps to your next destination. So we're going to just say that we took three steps. And so our first movement is um, turning off the alarm, and our second movement, just sitting at your chairs, can be just three steps in place. So we had our first movement, which is one, and our second one, which is one, two, three steps. So we have two movements. And we're going to add a third movement, which is putting on clothes. And um, so we're just going to think about maybe put, pulling on pants as our third movement. So we have our first movement, which is turning off the alarm, doing that all together, and we are walking three steps, and we are then pulling on pants. Yeah, and our, for our fourth movement, we're going to say that we opened a door of some kind, right? You probably went out the door at some point to get to your car. So we're going to say that we just, just opened the door. And we're going to do that with our left hand, so we're using the right hand before. So we are turning off an alarm. We are walking for three steps. We are then pulling on pants, and we are then opening a door. For our last movement, we'll say, well, our almost last movement, we'll say that we get into the car, and we put on a seatbelt, and then we drive. So we say we're going to put on a seatbelt, and then we are driving. So our first movement was, again, turning off an alarm. Our second movement was walking for three steps. Our third movement was um, putting on clothes. We're then opening the door. We're then getting into the car, putting the seatbelt on, and we are driving. You know, it's really hard to do this with the microphone. This is something I hadn't really figured out the coordination of, but I should be uh, able to do it. Um, so we, can, we just do that movement sequence all together again, and then I'm going to ask you to, we're going we're gonna to add a kind of a different rhythm to it. So the first thing was we were turning off the alarm. The second thing is where we are taking three steps. We are pulling on pants. We are opening the door. We are putting on the seatbelt, and we are sitting down. And we are doing, and however you drive, right? If you drive, you know, whatever, one hand or two hands, or however you do. Um, so now I'm going to ask you to put that in a waltz rhythm, which is one, two, three, one, two, three, right? So we're going to go like this. We're going to have this turning off the alarm, one, two, three, 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 driving. Yeah, so we're going to take that back and put that into waltz again and do do that again. Y'all did pretty well with that. So we are, here we go again. One, two, three. One, two, three. Pants, two, three. Open the door. Two, three. Sit. Seat. Belt, two, three. Drive, two, three. How bad? That was pretty good, you guys. Good, good, good. So just, just, just to kind of show you how, and, and it even happened earlier today when when uh, we we added the uh, saints are marching in to we were, right we were just marching in place and then we added the the song to it it seemed like everyone kind of was able to kind of keep the beat a little bit better and added some energy and things like that so if you can just add a little bit of a rhythm you know with cha cha rock step triple step or some sort of you know waltz one two three one two three kind of feeling or whatever it is that that kind of gets your rhythm going um, adds it it help it helps smooth the transitions out in terms of your movement. Now what I'd like you to do is face your part, a partner of, of some kind. And we're going to do a little mirroring activity. So this is something that you, uh, you might, uh, in an intervention, someone might do in a dance improvisation class. Um, or they might do even in a regular dance class, this kind of mirroring activity. And all your, all your um, the person in front of you is going to do is they're going to just take their hand and they're just going to move their hand in different directions. And you're just gonna, you're just their mirror, and so you are following exactly what they do. So you're just exactly following wherever. So if they're going up or down, or side or side, or wherever it is that the hand goes, you are exactly following and just replicating that. So if you could try that with a partner, the partnering activity, following the hands, and you want to try to stay as close as possible to their movement. There's lots of laughter occurring. That's a good sign. So, so then switch, um, switch leader followers. So switch to the other person. So now the other, the other person. person so now the other, and the other one is the follower. You can see how that works, right? Just different, different spatial ranges. Whether it's side to side or going up and down, or circling, following that. You can use two hands if you like. Yeah, 
guys doing a hand job over there? I thought you were. That's nice. That's nice. All sorts of craziness going on. It's good. Good, never relax. Never relax. Although you seem pretty relaxed anyway, but it's good. Good. So the nice thing about dance, dance improvisation, I actually have been teaching dance improvisation for about 12 years, and um, with all different kinds of populations, um, different individuals with, with different kinds of, of mobility limitations and, and, and what you perceive as non-limitations. Non -limitation. um, and what's fun about it is it really gets it, uh, uh, the person, person to be um, in charge of their own creativity and their own movement, so that it's not me just dictating movement to you. So in some classes or some dances, uh, dance classes that you would go to, it's very formal. It's very you're just learning from that person, and you're not really the initiator um, of anything. Uh, so I think um, it's very beneficial to actually be the the kind of uh, to have a lot of ownership and engagement in terms of what what your body's actually doing, and not always it, not always having that dictated to you. So this next exercise is even just a little bit more animated and playful. Um, you're going to face your partner, and this time you're still doing a mirroring exercise between them, but this time you're making faces at them. So instead of it being hands, you're just whatever your, your face does, whether it's eyebrows raised or mouth or whatever it is, your partner is absolutely following you in this, uh, in this face dance. So you are mirroring your partner as they make interesting faces, faces and facial, and facial expression at, at you. <laughs> and then switch so the other person gets to the other person gets to leave. not ever done that with friend or partner um, you know something to do at random just for the fun of it is make funny faces especially if you don't have any energy some energy you need some energy just uh, make some funny faces friends and have them and mirror, have you mirror you and uh, in, enjoy that little fa face dance um, no but in, in all seriousness um, just in terms of enlivening uh, we were talking earlier about the nature of, of what happens with Parkinson's is sometimes the face and the, 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 um, the, uh, the movement there. And so enlivening the, the facial expression is being actually an important. And also, I, we do this with actors and dancers. So this is, a, again, an exercise that we do to actually wake up eyes and wake up, you know, all of that, those expressive features of the, of the face. So it ends up becoming important. Um, what I'd like you to do next is um, one of the things that happens with Parkinson's is the, um, you know, the, the cessation of movement and that, that inability to initiate Part. movement on different parts. So I wanted to play around a little bit with you with an exercise where you're going to initiate movement from different parts of your body. And I'll tell you what part of the body is initiating. So what I'd like you to play with first is shoulders. And this is just, just however you want to think about the shoulder kind of leading through the space. And it can be both shoulders. It can be uh, one shoulder. You can think about taking the shoulder up or out or forward or back or circling around. So just playing around with shoulder movements. Um, kind of this kind of mobilizing the shoulder girdle, um, shoulder movements, and where that can kind of go in the space. And so that if the shoulder, in fact, was leading your movement, how would that possibly move you, move you through the space? If there was a if it was a navigator, how would it move you? So shoulders. And then try rib cage. So now trying the rib cage. How, if, if someone put a little string on the rib cage and wanted to pull you around with that, how would the rib, how could the rib cage move? So it could move forward, right, move back, move side, right? How can the, move, the rib cage move? So just playing around with that mobilizing of the rib cage, right? Side, side, forward, back, forward, around. Move to the rib cage, right? We do a lot of this kind of stuff in jazz. A lot of isolations, uh, isolations of body parts. So you can find that kind of mobility. Rib cage. 
And the last thing, just hand. Again, the hand. If the hand is the mobilizer to space, where can the hand really take you in the space? Um, down, up, around, can it circle? Um, how can it change speeds? Maybe fast, maybe slow, maybe flow, maybe cut, maybe slice, right? Ripple, flow, float, right? Playing with maybe qualities of like how that can kind of move for you. Right, punch, right, can play with more force. So it's interesting because in terms of movement, again, a lot of times we say, oh, well, you know, you just need to get from point A to point B, or you just need to lift your arm. But in dance, it's all about how you lift your arm. It's all about the quality. Because if I do this kind of movement to you, it communicates something very, very differently than if I do this movement kind of to you, or I do a slicing kind of movement, or has a lot more percussiveness or something like that to it. So for dance, it's all about the nuance of the quality. So we do play with all of those textures of movement so that you get a little bit clearer and can play around with that kind of movement detail, kind of which is something that, again, gets lost with part Parkinson's is this kind of like clarity of where and how exactly is my body or can my body move and how can it find a way to kind of re restore, renew that, that, those connections. connections. So what I like to do with that body part initiation again, play with the rib cage, we played with the shoulder, we played with the, the arms. So what I'd like you to do now is to put this into a little bit of a rhythm so that we're going to go for four counts. We're going to go rib cage movement one, two, three, four. Arm, two, three, four. Shoulders, two, three, four. Rib, two, three, four. Shoulders, two, three, four. And arm, two, three, four. Good, not bad at all. That was pretty good, you guys. Not bad at all. Um, ch changing it up just a little bit to add, to add a little challenge. Um, this time, we're just gonna go, we're gonna go arm for one, we're gonna go arm one, two, rib cage three, four, and then we're gonna take shoulders five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 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 Yeah. So if there's a hundred different ways, then you could you could vary that in terms of rhythm. And then all of a sudden, those just very easy, simple movements become dance. But when you start to play with, you know, how can you play around with those counts, it can be very, become very um, creative. And also this idea of starting the movement and stopping it, right? So in dance, it's not, it's, it's about that, that clarity of cessation and continuation of movement. And that's one of the things that, in the research, they are talking a lot about how um, ballroom has been effective, um, but in particular, how Argentine tango has been effective. And I was curious to know, well, why was it that, in particular, Argentine tango was, was found, in this case, to be, to be more effective? And it was because the movement cessation, the stopping of the movement and the going of the movement is so quick and there's so many interesting changes that are happening, and so it's very a very dynamic challenge in that way, slightly different than Walton Foxtrot um, in terms of ballroom dance. And so, and the other thing with tango um, is that there's a lot, a lo little bit more improvisation. So you don't quite know if you're working with a partner what's going to happen next, and that challenge becomes very good for the nervous system in terms of of, of Parkinson's. So that was really interesting, but you could replicate, I mean, you don't have to go out and take Argentine tango, great if you do, um, but you could replicate that same idea in even doing movement improvisation exercises like this, which, which are, again, just moving different parts of the body, playing with your timings, playing with directions, stopping and starting the movement at various kinds of times so that you're challenging yourself in that way. I think uh, in this particular study, I, um, um, which was Walgreens, dancing that I kind of mentioned, it was Waltz, Fox, Trot, and Tango for one hour, two times a week for 13 weeks. Participants, all reported, all reported, all participants reported improvements in walking, balance, coordination, mood, and endurance, while the control group did not improve, and in fact, um, grew worse in disease severity. And as I just mentioned, Argentine Tango proved better than traditional exercises for improving balance and functional mobility in those with PD. 
Um, and a PET study demonstrated that there was increased activity in the basal ganglia when tango movements were performed to a meter and predictable beat. So we just talked about that sort of rhythmic structure being, being important and why dance can then be such an asset beyond being obviously like we just demonstrated, playful and enjoyable and those kinds of things that um, also bypass some of the, the normal brain, brain uh, um, status quo functions. So frequent movement initiation and cessation, spontaneous directional changes, and a wide range of movement speeds. And that's really what, uh, you know, modern dance, uh, contact improvisation, um, so many forms of dance encompass um, in terms of skill sets is we're always, you know, it's always about this like weight shifting and changing direction and understanding where we are in the space and being able to sort of regulate that. And so that's why it becomes um, very, um, helpful in terms of in terms of Parkinson's. The nature of dance uh, requires exactly what becomes missing or impaired in Parkinson's movement manifestations. Therefore, dance is an ideal form of therapy to address PD. Um, now you all already know these symptoms, but just to um, review them, postural instability, gait difficulties, impaired functional mobility, freezing of gaits, difficulty with movement initiation, turning and bradykinesia, uh, difficulty with attention or memory, and depression. Um, so dance, dance involves auditory, visual, and sensory stimulation, musical experience, musicality, social interaction, memory, motor learning, emotional perception and expression, and emotional interaction. And that kind of an enriched environment really um, creates a very nice um, uh, kind of holistic, kind of complete um, form of therapy in, in terms of um, stimulating uh, exactly the kind of the, the things that need to be stimulated in, in Parkinson's. Um, wanted to do another little um, kind of rhythmic activity with you, uh, which is um, more about sound. It's a, it's a little bit of a challenge, um, but I think you all will be okay with it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to you're just going to um, at your at your seat you're just going to um, stomp for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The next time we do it, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Clap on eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Clap seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You, you kind of get it until we go all the way down. So we can just do that all together. Ready? Here we go. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, clap. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, clap. And one, two, three, four, five, six, clap. And one, two, three, four, five, six. And one, two, three, four, five, six. And one, two, three, four, and one, two, three. And one, two. And one. Good job. Yeah, that was good. That was good. So, um, and then you could change that up and do the reverse of that. So, of course, you could you could um, clap with the upper body eight and stomp for one or whatever. That's just a very simple rhythmic kind of exercise um, to integrate actually um, upper and lower halves of the body and get the kind of that rhythmic sense going so that you, again, you're just um, kind of challenging your movement in, at, on another kind of level and tap, hopefully tapping into other areas of the brain. thing I meant to mention earlier is um, in relation to rhythm that my experiences I also uh, was a caregiver to my dad who had a severe brain injury I didn't have Parkinson's but he had a severe brain injury and therefore interfered with a lot of his motion and movement abilities and through that experience I learned that the arts and particularly um, dance and rhythm was really key in, in his therapy in, in, one, in the one sense that he had a lot of difficulty with memory um, he had extreme short-term memory, he really just couldn't, couldn't learn exercise, he couldn't learn many new things at all, and, and could not retain it. But one of the ways that we were able to teach him things was through um, rhythmic, um, like, 
poetry or, or something like that. We would actually create something that at least had a rhythm to it. And as long as we kind of started him off on that, then he was able to continue it. So just for my own life, just not, uh, have noticed, not, noted the power of, of that, of that um, sense of musicality and, and using rhythm um, as, a, as an intervention to really help. There's a, there's a couple um, dance interventions um, that are out there that have been used in, in Parkinson's. Um, one, of, one of them we'll, we'll do, which is called the brain dance. And it's a, um, a, a series of, of movement exercises um, that are based on um, uh, so, sort of primary uh, motor patterns. And we'll, we'll go through those. Um, this was coined, uh, Andrea Gilbert coined the term brain dance um, because she said it also um, really stimulates the, the brain body connections in that, in that way. And um, some of the exercises were actually developed by a, phys a physical therapist, Arngar Bartiniev, um, years ago. And people sort of built on, built on her work. Andrea Gilbert has a, a movement, um, a movement center that she works with with young, uh, young children all the way up to, to um, many, many ages, um, older adults, and she uses the brain dance and, and the bartini of the, these fundamental movement patterns. And works with people on many different levels in Seattle, Washington. Um, Motivating Moves is actually, I think it's still a, an available DVD that you can find out there that also draws from the, the, these fundamental movement patterns and was created by Janet Hamburg, who um, was a dance professor that worked with individuals with Parkinson's. And um, it was developed specifically um, with, with that in mind. So those are just two kind of resources that I've, I've drawn from, and I will introduce you to these, these kind of basic movement patterns in, in just a minute. Um, the other thing is, and you might have heard of it, is, is the Mark Morris Dance Company started doing outreach for Parkinson's um, some time ago and in New York, and that program's going well. There's um, some, um, some literature on it, and my understanding of it is that they're actually doing some kind of certifications for people as well, um, but, but their program incorporates um, ballet, and, and I found this in some others as well, that they're actually using ballet bar exercises um, because of course ballet very much works on posture alignment and you know um, strengthening um, the erector spinae and, and just strengthening the whole core of the body. Um, it's also very challenging again in terms of rhythm and coordination and things like that. Um, and aesthetically, you know, it, and also very beautiful and, and there's a lot of grace involved. So you know, we'd all like to kind of move as gracefully as possible through through life. So um, ballet has definitely been used. Ballet bar exercises. Some also uh, have incorporated jazz, and then these, these um, other some other programs I've noticed also incorporate these improvisational ac activities that we kind of just did some of these like movement improvisation activities. There was one study on contact improvisation um, that I found particularly interesting. So they were they were using a lot more partnered kinds of things about weight sharing and um, things you could do with partners to again sort of challenge movement coordination and and um, you know movement ability in general. So I wanted to go through these um, with you. Let me. Okay, so these are the fundamental movement patterns. And again, in any of these, they're, they're kind of like basic exercises, but then you can manipulate them in a hundred different ways to become more dance-like if you'd like to. Um, and actually, the thing, well, one thing that's not listed up there is um, tactile stimulation, and it usually starts with some form of tactile stimulation. So the first thing we're going to do is actually um, tap on the chest, and again, it's, it's hard to do this with the, with the microphone.
questions come up to I know you did uh, this uh, because of meditative breath um, motion this morning, and so you can do a number of different kinds of things with the, the breath pattern. Breath is, is one of the most fundamental patterns of movement in the human body, in, in that we, you know, as we come out, we take that, that breath of fresh air and it opens, it lifts the rib cage and, and um, spine lengths and um, are affected as well. So it's a very internal, natural form of movement. Follow your thumb, and so you have a little bit of eye tracking going on there as 
you do this, coordination. Pull left side, toes to the right side. Pull right side, toes to the left side. And, uh, and the idea with that, the idea with that is that the, um, again, it's the whole right side, so it's leg and arm together, and left side coming to it, and the whole left and right side moving together as well. So it's a clarity of being able to, again, separate sides, which sometimes we, we lose that ability. Um, so that's body half. The last one is cross lateral. Cross lateral is the normal walking pattern that we do um, in the, the, the children do it as they crawl and, and as we as adults walk. So cross lateral pattern means um, taking um, the opposite limb and connecting it to the your opposite side. So if it's this, your, if your left arm, you're going to connect it to your um, right knee. So we can just kind of, kind of do an elbow to knee sort of thing of opposition where you're just crossing the body. Yeah, so you're just taking that and bringing that over. So it's a cross kind of connection. Another way you can do it is to reach here and then reaching all the way down right across the body here. You're actually reaching through the spine and reaching to the opposite side. So it's also about spatial connectivity through the, through the spine, reaching to the opposite side. So that, that's the idea of, of cross lateral kind of connectivity. Cross lateral is also seen very naturally in, in skipping and things like that. So that, that pattern is important. Uh, when you see someone try to skip and they try to skip with like two sides, like they try to do like kind of a robot kind of skip, they're missing, you know, that understanding or ability to access cross lateral movement. Um, so that a natural ability to cross the, the center line. And any of those exercises um, can again be done in rhythms or played around with in terms of uh, different kinds of music um, and, and you know certainly you don't have to adhere to those patterns but that is something that you could you can do at home if you like. I think that's it. That's all I have there. Yeah. So I think it's time right? Just two of it. Thank you. I just want to thank you so much for your time.